Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to another episode of our look at the flat earth version of the sexton. In this episode, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the horizon and some of the misconceptions that the flat earth have been putting out about the horizon and how a sextant works with it. And to do that, we're going to have a listen to Nathan Oakley and Brian's logic. We have a short two minute clip where we go over a lot of the misconceptions they've been promoting about the horizon in the last few years and the new ones they're trying to do to counter the sextant. So let's cue up the music and get going. And by the way, I've changed my audio and visual settings on these videos and I'd appreciate a little feedback in the comments on it. So let's get going. Now we're going to go ahead and get started with this short clip. It's about two minutes long and it's Nathan Oakley and Brian's logic. But that extra redundancy stresses Brian's point, which is what chocolate's driving at. You know, it's not actually doing that. But most people on our anti-flat earth opponent side don't recognize that apparent bit in the definition of a horizon. Now, don't get me wrong, you can still have a physical geometric horizon that's apparent. I, it rises, at, it looks different with your elevation that's part of the black swan it changes with elevation when it's geometric also so you can see beyond a limitation of a sphere edge if you rise in altitude also geometrically physically and that is what their horizon is it's still apparent so it's redundant to say well apparently the apparent position it's just not necessary now this is actually a key admission on the part of nathan oakley and that is that the apparent horizon can also exist with a geometric horizon. Now, while I don't think he understands what he's saying here, you cannot have an apparent horizon without a physical geometric horizon causing it. You are seeing an apparent image of the baseball on your computer screen. However, in order for that image to appear, there has to be a real baseball here. Now, the same thing goes with a horizon. You can have an apparent horizon due to refraction, but you're looking at an actual physical object and the light from that object is being refracted to your eyes. It's not a hologram, it's not a figment of your imagination, it's a real thing. When you look out over the sea and see where the sea meets the sky, you're actually looking at water and air. It's real stuff. It's just further than you would normally expect on the geometric horizon because you have some refraction. Now another common error that they have, and they try and pass off as gospel, is that on a spherical planet with a radius of 3959, as they like to say, your geometric horizon is 1.22 times the square root of your height. So if you're at one foot, the geometric horizon would be at 1.22 miles. However, they like to add the phrase, no more than. That's not the case. In general, although there are, of course, exceptions, it's no less than when you start including refraction, because what refraction does is it extends your view. It's as if the Earth has a larger radius than 3959. That's why we use the term 7 over 6R. 7 over 6R is greater than 6 over 6R. But I found that it was refreshing that Nathan did admit that if you have a geometric horizon, it could be refracted and come into your eyes as an apparent horizon. That's at least an admission in the right direction. But we'll continue. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, after what Chocolate said, and I've said this before, and the proof, of you, proof of it, you can ask QE, because he's agreed with me when I've said it before. He, he even showed it exactly, right? Back in 2015 into 2016, all the flat earthers were saying, because the original claim was the horizon appears to rise to eye level. The baller started saying to the flat earthers in 2016, so the, would you say that the horizon rises to eye level? And flat earthers started going, yes, right? And then the baller started showing dips to the horizon sometime after that. The point is, is that the ballers changed the claim and lazy flat earthers started claiming what the ballers were claiming was that the 
Horizon Zero Rises Die level. That wasn't the original claim. The original claim was that the horizon always appears to rise to eye level, not that it actually does. The ballers changed that claim within debate with flat earthers. Flat earthers were too lazy to keep putting in the word appears and ended up being caught on being caught uh, in debates when ballers were showing them a dip to the horizon. Now here we have the second critical admission from the flat earthers, and that is that their original argument that the horizon appears to rise to eye level has been demolished by the use of the sextant, specifically the dip correction in a sextant. Now this always amazed me that they were making this claim because, because when you look at the horizon you're above the surface of the earth. It is obviously below your eye level. You have to look down to it. We've demonstrated this many, 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 many times. Yeah, it's no longer in question, and I'm glad to see they're finally admitting that we do have to look down to the horizon. Now they're trying to change it to say it appears to rise to eye level. Well, no, it doesn't. It appears to rise to the center of your vision because you're looking at it. So once again, this is kind of a fantasy and an attempt to try and shoehorn this into their narrative by saying it appears to rise to eye level. It doesn't. It never has appeared to rise to eye level. That was just their claim. It was disproven many times, and it's easy to disprove using something as simple as a water level, or an auto level, or a artificial horizon in the cockpit of an aircraft. But we'll continue. Listen to what Nathan tries to use to justify this. What is it achieving when you do a dip correction for a sextant? Well, it takes it from optical to geometric. And what particular aspect of geometry are we utilizing? Well, a straight line, something you don't have on the surface for a ball. And something that is absolutely required and works when you triangulate with a star because the surface is flat. That is how it functions. So it's geometric, takes it down to the ground so that you're drawing a straight line to the GP of the star in geometric terms. You know, it utterly amazes me when we get people like Nathan Oakley and Quantum Eraser that speak with such authority about subjects that they have absolutely not the first clue about. So let's take a few minutes and go over what the dip correction is, what it does, and why we use it. And then we'll compare it to a few real life examples. Now let's take a moment and just go over the basics of the sextant again and how celestial navigation works. There are two things that are given in celestial navigation. One is that light arrives from stars and the sun in parallel by the time it gets to Earth. That's a given. If you're talking about celestial navigation, you're admitting that. Second is that the surface of the Earth is curved because the Earth is a sphere. That is another key feature of celestial navigation, and if you want to talk about celestial navigation, you have to admit that as well. There's no other way to do it. Here we have a couple of red lines drawn from the center of the Earth. One goes from the center of the Earth through the geographic position of a star out towards the star. All right, this is a ray. Another goes from the center of the Earth through your position to your vertex or your zenith at 90 degrees above your head. That's also a ray. Now one argument that the Flat Earth tried to make in order to distract from this is to say, well, you've got a radius there. Well, no, I don't. That's a ray. The radius is a line segment going from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth. I don't have it marked there because I'm not using it. I also haven't marked the circumference or the area of this circle either. They're present on the board, but they're irrelevant to the topic that we're discussing. Now, after we're done getting our sextant reading and making our corrections, we're measuring this angle right here. That angle is that angle. Now, in order to get our latitude, which is this angle, we have to subtract this angle from 90 degrees. We do that here because these angles, that is called the zenith angle, and that corresponds to the angle there. But today, what we're talking about is the dip correction. Now, let's go ahead and see what the dip correction actually represents. So, I've cleaned up this diagram a little bit, but say that we take our sextant from this location and we see a star out there. 
Now, we are not necessarily going to be measuring this angle directly unless we're using something like the Link A12 bubble sextant, where we establish a vertical and then draw our own horizontal within the sextant from that. What we're going to be measuring is the, the line to the star, and then we're going to be measuring a line down to the horizon. We're going to measure this entire angle right here. Now, as Brian correctly points out, what we then do is that we then take this perpendicular line and establish a horizontal. We're going to be measuring HS, which is this whole angle. So we've got to get rid of this angle right here. And for that, we use the dip correction. Now, the dip correction is related specifically to how high we are above the surface. And it's the amount of angle that we have to take away from the full HS angle to get up to this horizontal line, which is parallel to the tangent line to the Earth at our location. Now, lately in the flat Earth, what they're saying is, okay, well, you measured an angle that takes straight lines. You can't get straight lines in a refracted atmosphere because it's not a no atmo day, whatever that means. So therefore you can't use the instrument. Well, first of all, we can measure an angle on a curved line. Now I'm gonna do this in a very exaggerated fashion just to make a point. Now, their big contention is that when we're looking through the atmosphere of our planet, our light is getting refracted and we're not getting straight lines. We're getting curved lines. I'm in agreement with that. Now we have two questions to answer. First of all, how much is that curve? And is it significant? And if it is significant, or even if it isn't, are we making an adequate correction for it? If we take the dip correction out of the Naval Almanac, and apply it to this, do we get a true horizontal line? Now to answer those questions, we're first going to go to Walter Bisland's Advanced Earth Curve Calculator. And here we go. So here's the Advanced Earth Curve Calculator, and let me show you the data that I put in. I put in zero refraction, so we're looking at the geometric horizon from an observer height of 20 feet at a distance of 20 miles to a target size that's 20 feet. Why did I put these values in? simply to make sure that that was well beyond my visual horizon so that I could just read numbers to the horizon from my 20-foot observation location. So let's go down here. We can confirm that our object is well underneath the horizon, so we don't see any of it. Now let's go down to the horizon data. According to this, the horizon is about 5.5 miles away from 20 feet. And the dip angle to the horizon is 0 0.7926 to four significant digits. So we're going to go ahead and write that down, and then we're going to add some refraction in. Now here, everything else is the same, except I've put in standard refraction. Now we're going to go down here once again. Our object is still hidden below the horizon. And here's our horizon data. Our dip angle is 0 0.072 one, eight, the four significant digits. Let's write that down. Now the moment of truth. If you multiply your zero refraction of 0 0.07926 by 3600, which is the number of arc seconds in one degree, divide that by 60, you get the number of arc minutes that that angle represents. With zero refraction, it's 4.75 arc minutes. Now just to put this into perspective, 4.75 arc minutes on the surface of the Earth is 4.75 nautical miles. Now if you take standard refraction, which is this angle, and convert it to arc minutes, you get 4.33 arc minutes. A difference of 0.42 arc minutes. The difference between those makes less than half a nautical mile worth of difference. Now when you go to the Naval Almanac and you pull up the dip correction for 20 feet off of the water, is it going to be 4.75 arc minutes or is it going to be 4.33 arc minutes? Now again, it may not be exact, but what range is it going to be in? We're dealing with a standard refraction day and that dip correction is 4.33 arc minutes we've adequately corrected back to our horizontal. If it's any other number, well, we haven't. And then we can figure out what the error would be from that. So let's go to the Naval Almanac and see. Now here is the appropriate page from the Naval Almanac. This is the dip angle 
for height above C in meters. 20 feet is about 6.1 meters, so it's going to fall between 5.89 and 6.16. The dip correction would be 4.3 minutes to 4.4 minutes and a little closer to 4.4. Well, Nathan, bad news. It completely matches the Earth curve calculator with standard refraction. Try another argument. Well, guys, there goes another flat Earth argument, actually two of them. The first is their free admission that their previous claim that the horizon appears to rise to eye level has been demolished by the sextant and the dip correction. Second, Nathan's objection to having a refracted line causing an angle to the horizon has been refuted by showing that the dip correction not only takes into account the spherical Earth, but refraction as well and gives us a horizontal straight line to measure our angle from. So, in our next episode, we're going to talk about circles of equal altitude, and I'll see you then. Take care.